I have this just dream one day that I will get a chance to do a, a cameo in, in some of my favorite uh, sort of series, whether it's a Marvel movie or, or a, uh, a Star Trek movie or even Star Wars. This is like uh, a artistic mecca for me in many ways. I've dreamed about going to the actual Comic-Con. I've been to some spin-offs before, but never the San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, so for me, being out here in California for campaigning reasons, to get a couple hours off to do what is to me just as a, as a big nerd, uh, uh, this is just like, uh, just incredible. And now I'm doing an interview with Sci-Fi. <laughs> I love your channel. There's been many a night where I've been scrolling through, not being able to sleep and finding a great old sci-fi movie on your channel. What makes you think I haven't already? Oh, that's true. You know, <laughs> the good thing about cosplay is like, you don't know. Is that the senator under that Iron Man mask? <laughs> or, or is that just another another regular uh, uh, Comic-Con regular? So yeah. I, can't, I, I can't confirm or deny whether I have walked through uh, Comic-Cons before in something where people could not tell my identity. My girlfriend has been to a lot of Comic Cons in her own day, uh, and is and is literally. I'm very excited that I'm dating a woman who has been a part of the Marvel universe and actually had to patch up Daredevil. <laughs> okay, I really wouldn't try to move too much. You've got two or three broken ribs. I played it cool when we first started dating, but at one point I had to start geeking out on her that she was a part of this universe. But uh, uh, I would love to be able to go with her where we could be dressed up and nobody would know who we were, so we could actually just really enjoy Comic Con uh, uh, in a ways so that we probably wouldn't be able to right now. When you run for president and you have a Senate job, it is, it is the least amount I've been able to participate in media ever. I have all these things backing up on my TiVo and all these movies I haven't been able to see. So we try to have a couple deals that aren't broken where we save things for each other. Um, so we, we saved Black Mirror for each other uh, and actually got a chance to watch it together. But she at one point violated that agreement and watched something without me, which I felt that was, uh, the, I think, one of the bigger issues we've had in our relationship. Now, she would deny this. We had arguments over this. She said she did not break the code. I say she did. You know, this is, we, we might have to get some counseling on this issue. <laughs> Kapla. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> you're going to get me really in trouble. This, this video will come back to hurt me. <laughs> um, I don't know if you knew this fact. Where was the first Star Trek convention? I'm gonna guess Newark. You know, you're a smart man. In Newark Public Library, in 1969, they had what they called it Star Trek Con. I'm very proud that my city could claim that we are the birthplace of Star Trek conventions. I'm a huge, huge, Star Trek fan. It's like, uh, has been a part of my life uh, since I was born, uh, really. My father was just a, a massive fan. But as a little boy, he sat me down and just said, this is a show you must watch. And it was that important to him in, in terms of where, how it shit was already impacting culture. Probably then it was the 70s that, that, that I probably had that conversation with my dad. And I just, for me as a guy growing up, you know, growing up black and seeing a, a future where we have overcome racism and poverty and all of those challenges. But more than that, that we, as a, as a, as a species, humanity pulled together such that, that they were doing things or beyond imagination. And then what was exciting in my generation is to grow up and see things on Star Trek and then see technology catch up. I mean, now the flip phones that they used to have that seem so amazing, we've now gone beyond that. And as a young kid, it, it, it challenged me to dream bolder dreams. It challenged me to have hopeful uh, uh, belief in what we could accomplish together, the best of human instincts. Uh, that combined with science and technology and innovation, um, basically it made me believe that the future could be incredible and great and to be a part of making it so. I started a, a Star Trek club at, uh, at Oxford <laughs> and Star Trek The Next Generation for me is my favorite and uh, John Luke Picard is my favorite captain. Maybe it has something to do with his incredible hairstyle, although Cisco uh, in Deep Space Nine gets that as well. Um, but uh, definitely right now it's, it's still that. I think Spock himself would say that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So that, that loyalty and friendship between the two people are great, but uh, I think that that was a mistake uh, for him to do that. It made for a great movie, but uh, the search for Spock, it, it, you say he put the whole fleet in jeopardy. Um, uh, if that is really the case, because I might argue that, 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 that point, but I think at the end of the day, Spock who sacrificed himself, uh, their last words, that moment where they put their, their hands on the, on the window together, I think that Spock made his intentions clear. Wow, 
how would I have handled the Borg, especially when Jean-Luc Picard was captured and turned into a Borg, which is very serious. I've been up in my, my life in, uh, against impossible challenges in defeating them. I do not think that anything is futile, especially actions of justice and righteousness, and, and, and you, it's hard to beat people that just won't give up. So um, I, I know I, we, we, because it's definitely a collection, we could beat the Borg if they would come. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like bullies, and I've heard him be bullied a lot. Uh, I, I'm tired of the anti-Wesley Crusher sentiment, and m nothing made me happier uh, than uh, his uh, sort of resurgence as a character, playing himself uh, on, a, on one of my favorite uh, uh, sitcoms, Big Bang Theory. So I was really happy to see Wesley Crusher sort of get a second act in that role. Um, I guess there's a lot of things I want to know. Right now I want to know like who's gonna be the next Captain America. I'm really curious how they're gonna evolve that character. I wanna know what life is gonna be like without uh, Iron Man, which is uh, really problematic. I'm excited with all of these sort of mergers going on right now, and as a guy that, in my professional life, I'm really worrying about corporate consolidation and antitrust laws. It's something we do not enforce enough. But there's something exciting to me that now the X-Men franchise and the Marvel franchise, the one we've been seeing, can be merging. And, and the possibilities for these stories in the Marvel Universe are just so, so exciting to me. So I'm curious what a lot of the folks, when they're writing, are they putting little seeds in place uh, that we may not have realized for uh, future stories. The beautiful thing about the X-Men really is confronting this other syn syndrome that we often do, this idea that we often bully or belittle people who are different. So I I'd love to I, I love the fact that there's so many layers to um, these relationships, and I'm hoping that they find some really exciting ways to, to kind of bring it all together. And I'd like to see team-ups that you don't expect, you know, that the comic books themselves, some of them have, they've explored, but it would be great to see them do it now. Look, there is an issue of collateral damage, and I love that they explored that. I mean, you see these superheroes blowing through buildings, and nobody talks about the person standing on the side of the building and gets hit by a piece of concrete. Look, with great power comes great responsibility. I think there is a place for proper regulation to protect people, um, and, and so I think I would, been on, I would have been on the side, even though I empathize with both sides in that, I think I would have been on the side of the folks that were like, uh, basically the Iron Man side. Yeah. On the Tony Stark side. Yeah. Team Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just be clear right now. I would not be Thor. I don't have the hair. <laughs> I just would not. Um, so uh, that's, that, is a, that is a dangerous question that you've just asked me uh, about assigning different, uh, different characters to the people in the race. So I will definitely take a pass on that. However, um, I, I still remember somebody made me crack up. Serious interview and the person looks at me and says, if Mitch McConnell is the Sith Lord, <laughs> are you a Jedi? <laughs> and I, I just looked at them and just started busting out laughing. But no, I will not assign characters to uh, people, it, especially because my whole purpose of my life is trying to get us to come together, to assemble, so to speak, and not to demonize other people so badly. All I know is that one way we can bring people together is when big movies come out, see if we can get a screening at the White House, get some Republicans, some Democrats to watch together, can't sit next to a, a person in your same party, uh, get some great snack food, which movie, the food, the, the food is very important, what, where you go when you, when you go. Um, but this might be a bonding aspect of, of, of getting, you know, if Hollywood let us have movies early, we could definitely get people together that sit together that may not do before. This is an idea you're giving me right now. If you had to think movies that impacted my life as a guy that was born like right at the beginning, you know, of that sort of early 70s great movies, um, I could go through some of these directors that had powerful impacts. But Star Wars coming out, I think in 76, I was just a young kid that was a powerfully impactful movie to me. E.T. just was incredible as a kid growing up. Uh, I am the child of a guy, and I was told he was, you know, poor, single mother, segregated environment, was born to a woman who named him Carrie Alfred Booker after Cary Grant Alfred Hitchcock, one of the great filmmakers of all time. And my dad would tell a story about being in a segregated balcony in a movie theater watching art watching a movie and he said the movie was about the salesman in Manhattan that was getting by on his wit and, and, and his sort of gift of gab. And my father said movies when you're a kid plant seeds and you know decades later he was one of IBM's first ever black salesmen and did so well where he first got a job he got promoted up to Manhattan and said what I saw in a movie as a child shaped the very trajectory of my life. And so my father was one of these people that would introduce me to film because he knew that 
even if it was something science fiction, something way out there that, that like me, it, it would plant seeds in me. And so what I loved about uh, the science fiction I watched growing up, uh, the fantasy, the superhero movies, is there was this drive for good, this, this drive for decency, for kindness, for um, extending a, sort of unmerited grace to people, even the villains uh, at times. And those values I just found resonant with the values that my parents celebrated as two products of uh, an activist in the civil rights movement. So this idea that in movies you often see redemption um, at a time when our society is pulling itself apart, I still am looking for the ending and I know that uh, that what will get us there is often the service and the sacrifice of everyday heroes. It's really wonderful. It's really wonderful to have parents that, that so believed that art could communicate values like that.